I uh, now have the pleasure of introducing my friend and colleague, Philip Sloan, who will present an overview of the issues of the conference. Philip Sloan is professor in the program of liberal studies and in the doctoral program in history and philosophy of science here at Notre Dame. Among many other areas, he has published widely in the history of evolutionary theory and in the history of biology since the Enlightenment. He also works on historical and philosophical issues in contemporary genetics, molecular biology, and biophysics. Known in his field by his distinguished publications, Professor Sloan is perhaps best known to the Notre Dame community as a highly esteemed and much beloved teacher and mentor. This conference reflects in many respects the vision of the conversation between the biological sciences and the humanities, which Philip Sloan has articulated in his writings, imparted to his students, and inspired in so many of his friends and colleagues. It is my privilege to welcome Professor Philip Sloan to orient us all to the issues we will discuss for the next few days. Phil. Can you hear? I'm using one of these voice mics. Uh, but I want to thank uh, Jerry for those uh, overly kind remarks, and, uh, and I hope I can uh, live up to such, uh, such kind words. Maybe my mother would believe them, but uh, anyway, I want to thank you. But I, I certainly want to join uh, with my colleagues and the others in thanking the uh, organizers of this uh, conference who work together as a team. Also, we're delighted with the presence of members of the Pontifical Council for Culture, Mon Monsignor Melchor Toka, de Toka, and then uh, and Father uh, Tomas uh, Trafni, and also the, uh, with uh, the presence of uh, Professor Gennaro Arletta, who has come here from Rome with two of his graduate students, and he is the director, the scientific director of the program. The purpose of my brief remarks is to orient some of the discussions we'll be conducting over the next two days. Now, in planning this conference, we intentionally placed the event late in the Darwin year, close to the commemoration of the publication of Darwin's Origin of Species on November 24, 1859. I'm sure that some in this audience are also feeling some Darwin fatigue by this time of the year. At my last count on the John uh, Van Wy Cambridge website that's keeping track of the various events, there were 43 multi-day conferences and 17 one-day workshops and symposia around uh, internationally with various other events commemorating every other aspect of Darwin. And surrounding this certainly is a tsunami of books, articles, and monographs on all aspects of evolutionary theory that have appeared this year or that will appear in the coming year, including our own proceedings, as the product of these many intellectual events. And I think this makes 2009 even more than 1959 or 1909 a publication landmark in the history of evolutionary science. Now, in designing this conference, we have tried to do something out of the ordinary in a year that's been overflowing with Darwin offerings. What Notre Dame can bring to bear are the resources that we have in the humanistic as well as scientific disciplines. Notre Dame's size, its college structure, and its Catholic intellectual heritage create unique conditions for a creative dialogue of the kind called for in the opening statement by the representatives of the Stock Project. And the Riley Center itself it generally aims to support interdisciplinary interaction through the holistic integration of complex issues at the intersection of natural sciences with social and humanistic disciplines. But if we are to create a new level of discussion of evolutionary biology and develop a new level of interface with traditional humanities, it's necessary to think <coughs> prospectively rather than retrospectively. On one hand, we have to move past the tired conflicts of the past. To assist us in this, we draw upon cutting-edge science, subtle philosophical and theological analysis, the richness of the Catholic intellectual tradition, and on new official attitudes within Roman Catholicism itself to the developments in modern science. Now, the encounter of the Catholic Church with evolutionary theory since the 1860s has been complex and multifaceted. Although in its official responses, it avoided outright conflict and thankfully never created a new Galileo affair to deal with, this was nonetheless rocky ground. 
and as revealed particularly by the detailed study Negotiating Darwin by Mariano Artigas, Thomas Glick, and Rafael Martinez, who had access to confidential Vatican archives, we do know that the encounter was not an easy one. Implicit strictures on the teaching and lecturing on, on evolutionary biology that developed in some Catholic circles at the end of the 19th century also played an important role in the history of evolutionary theory here at Notre Dame itself. These local difficulties particularly surrounded the work of Father John Zom, the dynamic scholar, priest, scientist, uh, and his efforts to in develop a theory, uh, a version of theistic evolution derived in part from Augustine, developed in his public lectures, which he uh, then were published in 1896 as the book Evolution and Dogma. This became entangled in controversies over Americanism and modernism as they returned at the time, and he ceased publishing on this topic after 1898. As a result of the Zom affair, the teaching of evolution here at Notre Dame developed only slowly with the first courses in biology with that name in the title only introduced in the 1950s. The library concourse has a display that will give you some brief history and some documents on this issue. But the shift in attitudes at the official level within Catholicism has been dramatic in the last 50 years beginning in 1950 with the encyclical Humani Generis, and particularly since the mid-1960s and the changes produced by the Second Vatican Council, which affirmed an important document such as Gaudium et Spes, the acceptance of an evolutionary view of human existence is part of divine action in history. This was reinforced by the call for a new kind of dialogue between Catholic theology and modern science developed in several letters and discourses by the late John Paul II, and these insights have been continued in the work of the Vatican Secretariat of Culture and in specific statements by Benedict XVI. We see this new attitude in the official effort put, uh, to, the, uh, to put the Galileo affair behind us with the calling of the Special Commission in 1992 to re-examine this whole event. This commission came to the conclusion that Galileo was essentially correct in his view of the relationship of re revelation, scripture, and science. Beyond this, there's been the explicit call for a new level of effort to develop what Pope John Paul II termed an interpenetrating dialogue between science and theology, as one might see in the ambition. But, but this does not mean a synthesis of science and theology, as one might see in the ambitious project of Pierre Teilhard de Chardin. Instead, it meant to quote a famous letter written by the Pope in uh, 1980, uh, published in 1988 on the occasion of the commemoration of another great scientific work, Newton's Principia, to quote, a unity that but was not an identity. The church does not propose that science should become religion or religion become science. On the contrary, unity always presupposes the diversity and in integrity of its elements, unquote. When uh, John Paul then wrote in his well-known letter to the Pontifical Academy of Sciences in, 1890, in 1996 that evolutionary theory was, quote, more than a hypothesis, unquote, reinforced by data from a wide variety of disciplines and inquiries, he was only making explicit the kind of openness to modern science that had been encouraged for several decades. Inspired by this vision, the Notre Dame Co Conference constitutes the third of four workshops and conferences held in 2008 and 2009 and also extended into 2010 that are devoted to evolutionary biology that is jointly sponsored, as we've heard, by the Riley Center and the Stock Project in Rome. The major Rome conference in March, which several in this audience attended, drew together leading empirical scientists, philosophers, theologians, and historians to engage in a high-level discussion of a wide range of issues generated by Darwin's work and the broader field of contemporary evolutionary science. Our conference, now positioned late in the year, is a continuation of the Rome conversations and ideally is a culmination of some of these strands of discussion. In conceptualizing the conference, we defined our goals in, in invitation to the presenters as four. First, examination of the present state of evolutionary theory. Second, reflection on further directions of evolutionary science through interdisciplinary discussions. Third, exploration of issues of evolutionary theory that influence our understanding of human nature. And fourth, development of the discussions surrounding the interplay between evolutionary science, Christian humanism, and the theology of creation. 
Now, admitting that each of these topics could constitute a full conference by itself, we have nonetheless been particularly concerned to develop some sustained synergy between these lines of inquiry, both in the design of sessions and in the speakers invited. We have asked our speakers to give shortened presentations to allow ample time for discussion between the presenters themselves as well as with the audience. We've also moved on two levels with detailed scholarly discussions paired with broader public lectures to which the general Notre Dame community has been invited. Now sponsoring this conference at a religiously affiliated university inevitably directs attention to the body of issues surrounding the historical conflict between evolutionary science and religious interpretations of the world. These can be hot button issues, particularly in the United States with its long history of conflict over evolutionary science and fundamentalist religious views. And some might hope that this would be a confrontational conference of that kind. They will be disappointed. What we do intend to accomplish, as suggested in the opening statement by the stock representatives, is a serious and sustained multidisciplinary dialogue that can clarify, if not solve, deeply suited, seated issues. Now to create a significant shift in perceptions requires, however, more than a polite and respectful conversation between people who do not make real intellectual contact. And the historical baggage these discussions carry is burdensome, and misunderstandings are very easy to generate. The specific ways in which evolutionary science, uh, the issues surrounding evolutionary science were formulated in the 19th century are still with us in the popular and public media, and they inevitably infect our more technical discussions in many directions. Terms and concepts like creation, design, teleology, chance, purpose, matter, nature, natural, mechanism, and fittest carry with them a wide halo of meanings and invoke complex historical associations. They are associated with contexts that have often been bitterly polemical, such as that which surrounds the familiar opposition of evolution and creation. This heritage also carries with it the burden of larger social and political struggles of the past, enlightenment materialism and its reactions, the Bismarckian Kulturkampf, the political events of European history after 1871, struggles within the Roman Catholic Church over modernity, the close linkage of evolutionary theory and eugenics in the early part of the last century, even the heritage of the Holocaust, which some have blamed on Darwinism. Robert Richards, one of our plenary speakers on Monday, has detailed in his masterful book how some of these events shaped the thinking of the German zoologist and evolutionary polemicist Ernst Heinrich Heckel, whose writings, more than any of those of any other individual, created the image of a great struggle between evolutionary science and religious belief. Even here at Notre Dame, it was the writings of Heckel that in particular led Father Zahm to go on the road with public lectures intended to show that evolutionary theory was not incompatible with Catholic belief and that it need not imply anti-religious worldview that he saw championed by Heckel. Regrettably, Zahm's efforts were badly misunderstood by his European readers who could see in evolutionary biology, particularly as manifest in the popular writings of Heckel, only irreligion, political re revolution, and materialism. Now, we're all aware of the replay of these old fights at a high decibel level in contemporary discussions. In the United States, the evolution wars reach into local politics, school board elections, and textbook controversies in various states, and these conflicts have affected the perceptions of many religious communities and their responses to evolutionary science generally. Our opening, two opening talks uh, by Francesco Ayala and Kenneth Miller, both scientists who have been concerned with these broader struggles, will give us some insight into these issues. Now to turn to, uh, briefly to some more specific issues before us in the conference, historians of science have given detailed way into the, in, in, to, to the way in which such com commemorations serve not only to celebrate specific events in the history of science, they can also define a scientific field and create professional consensus. It was 50 years ago this month that the great University of Chicago conference with a stunning 2,500 registrants from 14 countries in many ways consolidated what is known as the new synthesis interpretation of evolutionary theory. The synthesis of population dynamics, Mendelian genetics, and mathematical interpretation of natural selection. 
This has reigned as a consensus theory in Anglo-American evolutionary biology to this day. How the range of celebrations this year will alter, modify, or solidify evolutionary science in the future is difficult to assess. But it's interesting to think forward to the commemorations 50 years hence and speculate on how they will look back on some of the developments and perhaps even the fracture lines within the synthesis that will be addressed in some of the papers in this conference. I highlight three specific areas of inquiry that the conversation of the conference hopes to develop. The first is at the level of empirical biology. We've intentionally given first place in the program to working biological scientists whose research explores different strands within modern evolutionary discussions, with papers by Michael Lynch, Alessandro Manelli, Simon Conway Morris, and Bernard Wood. A second is uh, focus, issues of interest to philosophers and philosophical historians of science will occupy the late morning and afternoon with a discussion of evolutionary ethics by historian and philosopher Robert Richards, and then the analysis of evolutionary complexity by Sandra Mitchell, and the issues involved in the distinction of teleology and teleonomy by Gennaro Aletta. The transition to issues of theology and science will be initiated by philosopher Paul Griffiths, who will discuss evolutionary explanations of religion. The public lecture tomorrow evening by Archbishop Joseph Shizinski will address some of the major issues surrounding the understanding of, the emer of emergentism and evolutionary theism. This dialectic has continued with discussions of theology, evolution, and creation in the morning session on Tuesday, first from a perspective of Thomism with, by William Carroll and another developing on the insights of 20th century theologian Hans Ernst von Balthasar by Celia Dean Drummond. A third topic of concern uh, to the conference is perspective and retrospective. Our final plenary session will take on an imaginative step that looks both backward and toward the future by two historically oriented addresses by philosophers and historians Jean Guéon and Peter Bowler. Would things really be different today if we, did not if we had not had the historical personage of Charles Darwin, we might ask? The conference in McKenna Hall here will uh, we'll close with a round table open to the wider Notre Dame public, composed of internal and external participants. And this will address some of the issues of this, results of this conference by dealing with the question, are we beyond the conflict of science and faith? The conference as a whole then closes with Simon Conway Morris's public lecture on the, in the New Jordan Science Hall with the engaging title, Darwin's Compass, How Evolution Discovers the Song of Creation. And that will be sponsored uh, as we've noted by our co-sponsor, the GLOBES program. In this conference, we've made available space also for contributed papers by an international group of scholars who will address several additional themes. These are outlined in the program, and we welcome their contribution to our discussions over these days. In concluding my remarks, it's important to note, mention what this conference is not. It is not considered to be a Catholic solution to all the so issues posed by modern evolutionary science. Digesting the outcome of the, cons of, of the conversations of the four Riley Stock conferences requires another venue and other kinds of conversation. It is, however, intended to be more than an accidental juxtapositioning of diverse disciplinary interests. If successful, there will be genuine learning across boundaries and disciplines. We in the Riley Center welcome you. We look forward to our conversation together and to the stimulating discussions that we hope to have in these next few days. Thank you very much.